Итак, дорогие друзья, спасибо большое, что вы сегодня с нами. Напомню, что сегодня трансляция идет и в Zoom, и в Facebook. Первый университет креативных индустрий Universal University и отдел культуры и образования посольства Великобритании в Москве продолжают цикл дискуссий с международными экспертами в рамках проекта UTOX. И наш цикл лекций проходит в течение апреля и мая. Сегодня мы хотели бы обсудить очень важную тему, которая будет связана с технологиями в креативных индустриях и с тем, как изменяется мир под влиянием технологий, как он уже изменился и, может быть, как он планирует изменяться в будущем. И я бы хотела представить вам сегодня наших э, спикеров. У нас э, сегодня с нами э, Джейми Добсон, иллюстратор, дизайнер, художник и преподаватель University for the Creative Arts. И он расскажет, как при помощи дизайна можно... Э, решить современные проблемы в культурных индустриях. И э, Джейми э, работает давно э, с такими брендами, как Adobe, Philips, Sony и другие известные бренды. Его э, работы были выставлены в нескольких лондонских галереях. А University for the Creative Arts входит в топ-20 университетов Великобритании, которые специализируются на креативных индустриях. Э, модератор нашей сегодняшней сессии Крис Рейнбоу, иллюстратор и преподаватель университета Университета и Британской высшей школы дизайна. Э, Крис – художник, иллюстратор, работает с комиксами, также курирует проект образовательный курс по графическому дизайну и иллюстрации в Британской высшей школе дизайна. Я хочу напомнить, что данная сессия записывается, и вы можете задавать все свои вопросы, которые у вас есть, в чат, поэтому, пожалуйста, все вопросы, которые у вас есть, пожалуйста, пишите в чат, мы передадим э, вопросы э, нашему спикеру, и также, если вы смотрите нас в Facebook, то вы тоже можете писать вопросы в комментариях под видео, и мы тоже обязательно зададим ваши вопросы э, нашему э, спикеру. Э, и я хотела бы э, передать слово Джейми, Uh, Jamie, thank you so much for uh, your time. We really appreciate that we have you here with us today. Brilliant, thank you. Um, and I would like just to now hand this over to you. And uh, could you please introduce yourself? Yeah, of course. And a bit of uh, University for the Creative Arts experience as well. Of course. So, yeah, hello, everyone. It's really nice to meet you. I think I've got 20 minutes and there's lots of things that I want to talk about. So um, I'm from University for the Creative Arts. It's one of the things that I do. Um, until fairly recently, I was one of the heads of school at the, the University for the Creative Arts. But actually, I've gone back to my own, uh, to my own practice largely. And I'll talk more about that in the, uh, through the presentation. So, yeah, this, this is me. Um, these are some of the things that I've done. Um, some of these things are really you know, quite humdrum, quite kind of boring. Um, but I've kind of moved throughout my kind of career um, from one role to, to the next. And, and I guess most recently, all of these roles are creative roles. Um, and so I I studied architecture. I worked as, for, for a long time as an architect, then an architectural lighting designer. Um, and then I became a lecturer and then, then kind of other things happened. Um, so that's me. Um, yeah, so you find me now Professor of Design Education at University for the Creative Arts. I also teach onto the graphic design course and I'm a designer. Um, so they're the things that I do now. So through this presentation, I want to talk a bit about the past, a bit about where we are now and a bit about where we're going. And this isn't a kind of exhaustive presentation. Really, what I, what I want to do is give you some ideas, some things to think about in terms of the future particularly. So we're going to start with the past and a family story. Um, I'm, from a, I'm from a seaside town called Great Yarmouth. This is a horrible seaside town. Um, it's one of those places that's quite kind of faded and run down. Um, you know, my story is I was the first person in my family to not just go to university, but to get any qualifications. Um, you know, it was kind of a big deal. And art school for me was, um, art school for me was the kind of gateway into this other world. It was brilliant. Um, before I went to art school, I worked in a fish and chip shop, um, you know, by, by way of kind of illustration, maybe of, um, uh, uh, yeah, some of the more kind of hopeless jobs um, that I've done. Um, it was amazing though. I met someone who, um, 
I met someone who was, uh, he was an illegal immigrant actually in the UK. He was a qualified doctor. And he told me I was wasting my life and I should really take advantage of the opportunities that I had. And luckily I listened to him. So this is why I went to art school. There's the art school. Um, my kind of family story, though, is about fishing. So um, all of the men in my family until my dad were fishermen. Um, you know, this, this was part of the family narrative. And so I grew up really thinking that I was going to be a fisherman. Um, yeah, until, until I was old enough to work and the fishing industry had gone. So I had to find something else. Um, my great grandmother, though, she, she worked as part of the fishing industry. Her job was gutting herring. What a horrible job and gutting fish um, she lived a really long life she was 99 when she died and she used to talk about being uh, she used to talk about you know having lived for such a long time that she saw or read about the the first flight in 1903 um, and she boasted that she also she watched on television um, the Apollo 11 um, mission to the moon the first man on the moon in 1969 and she used to tell me she was quite spiteful really but she used to tell me that I was never going to see anything as significant in my life um, you know she'd seen these two events within 63 years of each other I was never going to see anything like it I'd kind of missed the boat um, and so yeah this is what I grew up thinking but so there's a, an illustration of these things that she witnessed in her lifetime. But, um, and, and I think I only really appreciated this fairly recently. Um, my grandfather took me to Debenhams, this Debenhams, when I was a child. This is probably about 1978 um, to see calculators. He was so excited about these devices, these calculators. I mean, they were incredibly expensive then, and he ended up buying one. Um, so, yeah, I've seen the kind of advent of the, the pocket calculator. Um, it's kind of interesting to put this, to put this, these kind of computers, I suppose, into context. Um, one of the earliest computers is a, a computer called Manchester Baby from 1948, part of the University of Manchester. Um, and this was the first computer that could kind of electronically store code rather than having to rely on punched cards. And then by 2013, we had something called D-Wave. This is now a Google company. And D-Wave is a quantum computer. It's so complicated that we don't even really know if it works. But there's been this huge um, kind of acceleration, this boom in terms of processing power. And, you know, this is significant, this processing power, because it enables us to do things. I think this is really significant. Um, you know, the, 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 these pocket calculators from the kind of early 1970s, the iPhone Pro 11, I think we're up to 13 now. Um, you know, in terms of their form, they're quite similar. In terms of their size, they're quite similar. Of course, in terms of what they do, they're worlds apart. Um, you know, the iPhone now, the iPhone, the iPhone is a portal into another world. Um, you know, I kind of both love and love, love and loathe my iPhone, but it's, it's a portal into another world. It allows me to do things that are science fiction. You know, I am now part man, part machine. I'm a cyborg. Um, you know, in, in you know, the, the term cyborg um, was termed, I think it uh, was coined in 1960 and kind of popularized after 1965 through this book. And what, what cyborg means is that, you know, it's a bridge between, between man and machine. An iPhone is a bridge between man and machine. Yeah, so we had this kind of idea back in the 80s that cyborgs were people like Robocop. Of course, you know, in reality, cyborgs are people like the guy in the woolly hat, you know? He looks like a younger version of me. Um, so I think this is significant. It's a, yeah, this is very significant. Right, okay, so the present. I want to talk a bit about where we are. So actually, we're kind of here. We're, we're in Blade Runner. Um, you know, this is an image of, um, uh, you know, Beijing at dusk. I think it's more impressive than Blade Runner, actually. And, you know, what about the hover car? Well, even better than hover cars, we now have, we now have jet packs. So this is, yeah, I mean, this is kind of crazy. 
um, you know, all of our dreams have come true in some ways. Our science fiction dreams have come true. And, you know, of course, we have, uh, we have augmented reality, virtual reality. Um, you know, these kind of technologies haven't really broken through yet. But, you know, there's been rumors now for years that Apple are working on Apple glasses. You know, when they do, I'm sure we'll rush to them in the same way that people have to Apple watches. You know, this will become commonplace. This will become every day. But then a step further than that. Um, so Elon Musk's um, Neuralink um, demonstrated a, a kind of horrible thing, I think about two weeks ago. So this is a, 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 an ape with um, implants in its brain. And so it can play Pong, the game Pong, um, just by thinking about moving the controller. Um, so, yeah, science fiction is kind of science fact. We're already, we're already here. We're already in the future. Um, in terms of design, I just wanted to talk about this briefly. Um, this is really important for me, this quote. The pioneers of our time aren't taking things at face, the world at face value as a given from outside. Rather, they see the world as something you can pry open. I like this idea. You can pry, you can pry things open. You can tinker with things. You don't have to accept them for what they are. And I'll come back to that quote in a, in a bit as well. So this is some examples of my, my work or the things that I've worked on. So as an architectural lighting designer, lots of architectural lighting schemes. And so things like the Millennium Dome and Gateshead Millennium Bridge and Swiss Re, a building in the centre of London in the financial kind of district. The interesting thing for me in all of these projects actually was, were probably for some people quite mundane things, control systems, the kind of technology and... I guess, kind of environmental considerations behind some of these projects. I love education. <laughs> and so I, I went back, you know, I was an architect, but I went back to university to study um, communication design. Um, and I used the skills that I, I had kind of accumulated over time around control systems, around light, around sound, um, to create devices that interpret the world in different ways but using existing devices, but, but taking them apart maybe and putting them back together again. And so this is a device that visually translates sound, a record to light. And yeah, so this, this is a photograph of this device. And this, this is an analog photograph. It's one, one, one single photograph. And the time it takes to take the photograph is the time it takes to play the record. It looks like it's computer generated though, but it's not, it's real, it's in camera. And um, in the kind of introduction, um, uh, it was kind of mentioned that I've worked for lots of people. One of them is Sony. So this is an advertising campaign for Sony, for Sony TVs and um, working with an advertising agency called Fallon. Um, so I'll flick through these. So it's the same kind of principle though. It's, it's building a machine using fairly basic electronics to then do something that looks polished maybe. But then sometimes, like in this project, taking this idea that's tiny, um, something that writes text this size, and scaling it up so it writes images at the, the size of a building. Um, so this is a company called Lightvert that I set up with a couple of other people. And then back to tech, um, one of the things that I, I do, I'm a, a consultant, a kind of European consultant for Nest, for Google's Nest. And um, one of the things I do is is propose other things they might be able to do with the embedded technology within their devices. So it's a really very creative role. And yeah, fairly recently, I've done a number of commissions for Apple. Um, and uh, these are things kind of specific to Apple Music. Okay, so I just want to talk now a little bit about, our, about my students. You know, I think this, this kind of interest, understanding in in kind of electronics and coding is really important, really important. So for graphic designers, um, I run things like physical computing workshops and toy hacking workshops. We take things apart, we stick them back together again in ways that were never intended. And it's really interesting to see how some of the students take some of these ideas and develop them. So for example, Phil Stewart, he founded a company called Preloaded and they do an awful lot of um, uh, VR work. So this is for the Mogli uh, Modigliani exhibition at the Tate Modern um, a couple of years ago. Uh, another project by him. This is um, 
a project or an exhibition at the moment, the V&A in London, about Alice in Wonderland. And so this is another VR project that he's, he's uh, produced. And um, Chris Cox, another graphic designer, he's now the art director um, for Us Two Games, based in London, but responsible for Monument Valley. Um, so it's interesting, I think, to see graphic designers you know, taking their kind of graphic design skills and approaches, but applying it in different areas around tech. Um, Richard Lyons, I think he's my last example here. Um, he went to work for a company called Design Studio in San Francisco um, and worked on the Airbnb rebrand and then was headhunted by Apple. And so he now works as part of a team responsible for the human interface guidelines for Apple. So a brilliant job. Um, right, the future. I think I'm doing well for time, so this is good. Um, the future in terms of design. So this quote again, and I think this is even more important maybe looking forwards, this idea that we don't have to accept things as they are. So an example of this, if we all use the same Photoshop filters, you know, all of our Photoshop photos will look the same. You know, this is the case if you look on Instagram. You know, why do we have to accept that these filters, you know, look the way that they do. You know, if we could prize them open, we could fiddle with the code, we could do something else with it. I think that's really important. And I think, for me, it's relatively easy to fiddle with the hardware, you know, to fiddle with the nuts and bolts, the cogs, these kinds of things. I, I understand this stuff. You know, I can look at something and, you know, you can imagine how one thing affects another. It is much more difficult when it comes to software. And so I think this is why it's really important that our designers have some kind of understanding of coding, know their way around at least. Um, so an example of, of the, the, the kind of hardware and the software coming together is this really charming project, I think, by Dominic Wilcox. Um, it's a pair of shoes that are called the No Place Like Home Shoes and they're GPS shoes. So he worked with some kind of bespoke shoemakers in Nottingham and the shoes have GPS built into them. When you want to go home, like, um, like uh, not Alice in Wonderland, a little uh, the yellow brick road woman, whatever her name was, Dorothy. When you want to go home, you have to click your heels together three times. It turns the shoes on. And then you've got um, in one of the shoes, the, the right hand image here, um, there are LEDs which show you which direction to walk in. And the shoe on the left shows you how far you are from home. So I think a really kind of lovely project, you know, a lovely project. And here he is. This is Dominic, the designer, finding his way home wearing his shoes. Actually, here he's finding his way to an exhibition where he takes the shoes off and put, puts them in a kind of display cabinet. Okay, so... So we kind of understand that. So now I want to be, I guess, a bit more kind of provocative. We understand that there's kind of hardware and there's software, but what else? What else is there? And actually, there are lots of things. Um, but really, I just want to talk about a couple. Um, biological material. Um, this guy here, Raphael Kim, is he's, he's a really interesting guy. He's a biohacker. Um, he takes biological material and he does things to it. He... He gets it to do things that maybe it wouldn't do naturally. An example of this, there was an artist that took a, a rabbit and kind of cut and shut the rabbit DNA with some kind of bioluminescent sea creature DNA to create a rabbit that glows in the dark. This is kind of horror almost, um, but fascinating. Raphael Kim also does something which is really interesting, um, something which is kind of known as speculative design. So he 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 kind of plays um, through his design. What he's doing here through a series of images is he's um, getting us to think about, well, what happens if, um, if these kind of microbes um, become a currency in some way? What happens then? You know, how, how might we share them or how might we trade them? Um, something that's, oh. <laughs> I'll pause it there. Something you've probably heard about, it seems like it's on the radio all the time at the moment, is um, music that's generated by AI, by artificial intelligence. And so recently there's a really, uh, I think last week, week before, there's a really interesting kind of Nirvana inspired 
um, piece of music track um, that was generated by a, a kind of Google algorithm. Um, you know, this is kind of interesting. These art forms that we, you know, we think come from the heart and are truly kind of creative can be, can be generated by computer now. You know, this is both kind of scary, I think, fascinating. But what we need to do, I think, is find out what our position is. And, and actually, my position here is, well, we've been doing this for a long time. Uh, there's a, a, this album, Computer Music, from the University of Illinois, came out in 1957. This did a similar thing. It was, um, it was a computer that generated classical music, and it's quite beautiful. Um, Heather Dewey Hagborg, um, her work is also really interesting and something that maybe we need to uh, we need to consider. What she does is she takes these discarded items, like a piece of chewing gum, and she extracts the DNA from them. And from the extracted DNA, she uh, she can determine what kind of person chewed that gum, what their kind of ethnic origin was, what kind of age they might be, these kinds of things. And then she produces portraits. Um, from the people that cast this material off. This is interesting, isn't it? You know, I think um, when you go into Sainsbury's or when you go into a supermarket, your supermarket, if you have a loyalty card, they know who you are. They know the kind of things that you like to buy. You know, what if they had this other information about you? You know, your DNA, they could extract this in some way. They'd build a completely different profile and sell you, you know, different material probably. And then finally, I think, um, a challenge. Actually, there are two things. So I'll turn the sound off here for a second. So the first challenge, I think, or the first thought, really, this is, is, um, you know, this is an advert from 2005 um, for Sony, something else that I worked on, um, again, with the advertising agency Fallon. Um, a creative director, an amazing guy called um, Juan Cabral, who uh, comes from Argentina. Um, this is real. This is this is in camera. This is 250,000 bounty balls bouncing down the street in San Francisco. I think one of the reasons this was this was so successful is because it's authentic. It's real. And, you know, I think we really need to focus on the kind of authentic, the real, um, the kind of human. Um, yeah. So I think rather than chasing kind of computer generated, maybe we need to look for something else, the essence of kind of human maybe in things. And then the final, final thing I want to show you. This is a game called speech. We look Actually, I'm going to pause there. And I'm going to play it again in a second. So this is a, a movie from 1954 from a school for the deaf in Margate in Kent. And what the teacher's doing, I want you to watch this. What the teacher's doing is she's teaching these deaf children to speak using really simple material. So watch out for the really simple material. Words by imitating sounds when you're too young even to know. If you've never heard a sound, you can't imitate one. These children have to be shown what sound looks like. There are all kinds of games that help. When you want to make other letters, you have to start using your voice. You can't do it by hearing, so you do it by feeling. Miss Taylor speaks, and the balloon vibrates, and you catch the feelings on your fingers. Your fingers must be ears to catch that voice and send it back to Miss Taylor. Speech is coming. So I think this is beautiful and it's profound. Um, you know, what this teacher is doing is using these really simple tools to do something you know, amazing teaching a child to speak. And I show this to my students often because, you know, they can be, you know, very keen um, to, to rush for the, for the, 
for the slickest, most technological kind of solution to a problem, rather than thinking about, well, you know, maybe what's the simplest way to solve this problem? Um, so maybe this could be a kind of challenge for all of us, rather than picking up our iPhones or going straight to, you know, Photoshop or InDesign. Maybe there's a different, a different approach. So hopefully that was useful. Um, hopefully that gives you some things to think about. Um, and I think we've got, yeah, questions now, hopefully. Thanks, Jamie. Um, yes, yeah, lots of um, things that uh, I made quite a few notes there, just um, it provoked a few thoughts and uh, gave me a few questions that I'd, I'd like to ask about um, coming from that talk. The first one um, that came to mind was uh, about, about your gran. Yeah. And what your gran had said about, um, um, and actually it occurred to the, me that, yes, in some ways she was wrong that because we've seen great change. But then I, th I thought, oh, maybe in some other ways she was right in that the, um, uh, talking about this first flight, this first moment of flight, and, and probably more, even more so this, um, the moon landing. Can I say more so because that would have been, te that was televised. Yeah. Um, and so maybe she was right in that those were moments of like, uh, that signif signify kind of great technological growth. And then some of the things you're pointing out, you know, they are things that we've seen grow like incrementally. Yeah. Um, is there a difference? Or maybe there are like, are there moments? Can you, do you think that, that we've had moments in our lifetime that connect to this technological growth? Um, well, I, I think you're, I think you're right to point this out actually, because what I've done you know, for the benefit of this presentation is I've kind of separated out these, these kind of separate events. And of course, they're all part of a much kind of bigger, um, you know, a, a bigger event, you know, I guess the kind of modern era, um, or kind of post industrial revolution, maybe, um, you know, maybe we need to see it in that kind of context. Um, I think the thing. So I think the, the thing that really strikes me is, is now though we're living in an era where you know, communication is so easy. And, you know, this presentation today is a, you know, an example of that. Um, my, you know, this, the same gran, she, she lost her, she lost her husband um, in about 1943, something like that. Um, and it, it was during the Second World War. And it took about nine months for her to hear that her husband was lost. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think that's kind of incredible. Now, now it would take nine seconds um, you know, nine minutes, and um, it wouldn't take nine months, um, you know, to receive the telegraph. Um, so I think, yeah, in terms of kind of communication, in terms of our kind of relationships with each other, um, through these new platforms, things have changed. But actually, in, in other ways, probably less so. Um, you know, it's one of the things that I, th I think through kind of COVID, you know, it's all, it's, I've, I've kind of been reduced to my grandmother in some ways. You know, I'm so used to traveling. Hmm. Um, but for the last you know, nine months or so, I've pretty much been here in this room, um, <laughs> not not going any further than the, the woods at the top of the road. Um, yeah. I mean, uh, it, it got me thinking, and if I, if I could identify any, and it did make me remember like one moment, but it wasn't, it, it wasn't a communal moment, like in the same way that the moon landing uh, would be. Um, or let's, oh, let's also... Or Gagarin, as soon as we, <laughs> yeah. uh, but um, I do have a vivid memory of uh, walk in being in London and walking down the street and seeing a poster in a bus in a bus stop um, on a bus stop, and it was that quite iconic um, Apple iPod uh, poster, and it yeah. said it just had a silhouette of someone. Kind of dancing i think and yeah. then it said ten thousand songs in your pocket yeah and i immediately understood what i was because i i was not like following i was not really interested like in yeah. keeping up to date with the, the future technology so it was a shock it was a moment and i just thought like oh wow uh, i didn't realize we were there now yeah i didn't and then ever since that moment i've sometimes thought that maybe there's maybe there's sort of two types of like the technological development yeah. And there's this sort of unanticipated, like things that surprise you. Yeah. But then sometimes 
it goes the other way. And I feel like we've, we're just very ungrateful. And there are some times when even when you have new technology, you can anticipate the next stage. Yeah. So yeah. I think like with, with cassettes, for example, I know they're trending yeah. again, but like yeah. uh, c cassettes, like even in the 80s when I was a kid, I was aware that there must be better than this. Yeah. There will yeah. be a time when we don't have to rewind things with a pencil. Yeah. And, um, yeah. and you know, there's things with technology now where you can always feel like, come on. Well, actually, we're, we're talking on video, isn't it? This is something that people have anticipated for a while. And they've been a bit, they've been impatient. Like, although people yeah. complain about it now, but they're like, when's this yeah. going to happen, this video? And of course, yeah. I guess the classic one is flying cars. Yeah, yeah. You know, as traffic, you know, like, so yeah, yeah. I, I don't know if, well, it's, it's you funny, about that, it? that, yeah, no, I how we anticipate and then don't anticipate technology. Well, I think there are two, maybe two things that, uh, that this makes me think of. One, just in terms of kind of now and what we're, what we're doing, even through this. Um, you know, I work for a university that has four separate campuses across a hundred mile, you know, geography. Um, I used to drive between the campuses. You know, every week I'd drive between the campuses um, because no, I couldn't get anyone else to use video conferencing. Um, mm -hmm. You know, no one would do it. But now, you know, it, we do it all the time. So it's one of those things where the technology was there. We used to complain about it. Um, we kind of overlooked it, I suppose. Um, but because of this crisis, we do it all the time and we're happy with it. You know, my colleagues today, I went to, onto the campus today. My colleagues today are talking about never traveling between campuses now. Um, you know, we're going to do this forever. And that, that for me feels like quite a positive thing in some ways. The other thing that, um, that you made me think of is that I've always been an early adopter. Mm. You know, I had, I had the internet, you know, in 1996 or something, you know, I didn't know anyone else on the internet. It was a boring, lonely place because no one else was there. Um, I remember buying a, a, a WAP phone, which was kind of, I don't even know what that was now. Um, yeah, a WAP phone. No one else had a WAP phone. So I'd be the kind of lonely person in the, you know, in the bar, you know, talking about my new device um, with no friends to, you know, no virtual friends to kind of share it with. Um, so I guess I've always been interested in, yeah, I've always been interested in tech. And I guess that, that's why I kind of end up doing the things that I'm doing now. But then I, I also, you know, I'm kind of a, I'm kind of a, a bodger, a tinkerer. Mm -hmm. I take things apart. You know, I want to find out how they work, you know. Um, you know, I remember once buying a, uh, you know, a hi-fi and it, I didn't like the color. So the first thing I did was take it apart and paint it. You know, I, I, I'm quite happy to do those things, to do some surgery, I suppose, in a way that um, I think is, is maybe a little bit unusual. Yeah, it's especially, I mean, I think it's definitely, I, I mean, I feel, I'm, I would say the opposite, because I guess an opposite would be a Luddite. And I don't feel like I, I try not to be scared of technology, yeah. but I, I, my, my philosophy is more like, I'll let people like you <laughs> like be the, yeah. the, the forerunners. Yeah. And I'll just, well, I just don't mind that. being a, a couple of years behind. Yeah. And yeah. also, I guess the trouble is, like, sometimes if you're an early adopter, you end up buying things that don't catch on. And Oh, yeah. 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 We, we do that. Yeah. It, I mean, that makes me think of something else as well, which is that I think the equivalent of a Luddite now is, is maybe the kind of maker movement, um, which is the, you know, not accepting, you know, our gadgets for what they are. Um, but what, you know, it, it's my kind of approach. You know, I feel a bit like a Luddite. I feel like, you know, I feel cheated if I can't, if I can't, yeah, look under the hood. Um, and I think the, you know, the kind of digital kind of fabrication, digital craft, I think all of that is a bit kind of Luddite-ish and I like it. Um, but yeah, it's not kind of accepting things for what they are, you know, wanting things that are, that have kind of quirks. Um, yeah, that aren't slick, you know, putting up with, yeah, putting up with, with imperfect um, kind of products because again there's there's a kind of authenticity there you know they're they're kind of they're not handmade of course they're machine made but they're you know maybe machine made by someone down the road with a beard rather than someone someone else that you're never going to meet um yeah, i think that's important um i think that we're talking about the, the quirkiness that brings me to a question about your about your work mm. so you were showing this uh, i really enjoyed yeah this um record traces is that mm. what it's called it's mm. like, yeah yeah. Um, I guess that's a play on words as well, mm -hmm. recording traces. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, that seems to be kind of come, come from a playful kind of, kind of quirky kind of engagement with, I mean, yeah, and play. 
you know, with technology and and, um, and analog and kind of futuristic and analog yeah. kind of approach. And then you were showing um, this work used in advertising and saying that, okay, this is something you've done with advertising. Mm -hmm. So I just wondered, like, is this something with, in terms of this uh, kind of constructing kind of machines and them being used in advertising, has this all been kind of you making stuff and then it being adopted to advertising? Or has there been any instance of someone giving you a brief yeah. and you being able to say, oh, I'm going to build a strange yeah. machine and see where we go? Yeah, um, I think the most successful um, of these kind of devices have been the ones where I've just made them. Yeah. And, and then, uh, you know, people have discovered them, you know, through kind of print publications or through social media. That, that has been the way that, you know, it's worked most successfully i think um I, there has been a few commissions though where i did something for a, a big german um kind of lighting manufacturer um you know it, it wasn't terribly successful because actually they um there were quite a lot of specifications around this thing um and there's been a few instances of that so that's one of them i also did some work for another big german technology or dutch technology company um and you know that was the same thing so so you know they had an idea of what they wanted and i think my kind of approach just couldn't quite give them what they wanted and then i did one project that was i i think had such potential it was a, a working for or doing a project with them um, at that time i think it was called red bull toro rosso the kind of formula one racing team and they wanted um they wanted me to interpret the sound of their racing car engines as they went around different bends at different racing circuits. And, you know, this really kind of appealed to the nerd in me, but again, they wanted something that was so slick um, that they would have been better off computer generating it because that isn't something that I could achieve. And so, yeah, for me, and also in terms of my own personal satisfaction now, I prefer to, yeah, to make these things based on kind of hunches and play. Um, yeah. Rather than, uh, yeah, rather than someone else dictating what it should be. And, and actually, that's one of the reasons that I, I teach as well as, you know, make stuff because um, I'm not a very reliable uh, kind of creative in that way. Got an interesting question here from Daria, actually. Um, she's saying, uh, do you agree with my design professor's assertion? Actually, I'm wondering if I know this design professor, if he's in art school or not. <laughs> do, you, do you agree with my design professor's assertion that design should be designed for the dumbest, that it should be understandable for everyone, and that design play is important to consumers? Uh, well, I don't know. I'm going to contradict the design professor, I think. Because, <laughs> Dangerous. Yeah, no, Well, because I, I don't really agree with that. But maybe it's just my kind of approach as well. I mean, I've never been interested in designing for the masses. And actually, actually, you know, I've always thought that you know, in terms of my own work, I'd, I'd like kind of maybe f ideally 10% of people to truly love it, you know, rather than 50% of people to think mm -hmm. it's okay or 90 percent of people to think it's okay so that's always been my approach and and what one of the things that i've been experimenting with over the last few years um with my students is to is designing for really very specific audiences so with some um computer game students for example we did a project last year where they had to design games for uh for elderly people and um, elderly people with arthritic hands and you know, I kind of loved this because it meant the students ended up designing things they wouldn't normally design. And they learned an awful lot through this process. And then I think the year before that, I did a project with students, graphic design students in Epsom who um, worked with uh, a kind of communal, uh, sorry, not communal, residential um, kind of facility for people who are blind. And so these are graphic designers having to design things for people who are blind. You know, that doesn't make sense, but they ended up with just amazing outcomes, these kind of tactile map outcomes. Um, so no, I really like what I tend to do is design for a very specific person mm. rather than everyone or the dumbest person. <laughs> um, yeah, I wanted to ask something relating to the um, 
the bouncing balls mm. advert for mm. is that was that Sony? Yeah, that was Sony XB? as well. Yeah, I think uh, for advertising was, TVs, wasn't it? It was, yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, yeah, it was about color. So that was the kind of That's concept. Right, yeah. We've got these colored balls. Yes. Um, well, I mean, I think what you said, it, you know, it, I think it's, it's correct. I mean, it, it's true, you know, that uh, I think that a lot of appeal is that it seems simple idea and that it's, it's gratifying to think that, oh, it's just as simple as something that was done realistically. Yeah. And I think that they, it was one of these ads where they were quite keen to sort of, to leak, have a sort of making of video perhaps coming out. Like yeah. it was, it's almost like part of the marketing, isn't it? To just to make sure you understand yeah, this was done really for real. And so, so I do kind of agree with that. But actually, as soon as you said that, it got me started, started thinking about it. Yeah. Because then I started thinking, well, actually, I mean, yes, these balls, okay, they really were released. But it, how real is it? Because this is in slow motion. Mm -hmm. And then it's got this sound, like non-diegetic sound of some yeah. music over the top. It's yeah. been color corrected, I'm yeah. sure. It's yeah. been... Um, uh, and of course, like you're watching it mediated through a screen on a like a TV. So, yeah, is it when you think about it like that? Perhaps it's just it kind of shows that. I'll, I mean, all of those things would have seen incredibly futuristic. Yeah, in the past. So we get yeah. used to things and then start. So I'll, uh, I guess I, what I'm saying is like our uh, window for what we consider to be real. Yeah, yeah, like moves. Yeah, no, you're, you're absolutely right. I, I think. The two two particular points though. One was this was this was two thousand and five, um, and you know social media was kind of still fairly new. I guess we were still in MySpace, you know, probably back then, you know, that kind of world, and um, and this did spread like wildfire, it, you know. So it really very effectively used social media, I think, to kind of spread the word. Um, in terms of the uh, it being real, there were some rules. Uh, that were kind of defined and so everything had to be sh uh, captured in camera um so there isn't any kind of computer generated stuff but you're right there is color tweaking um but yeah everything was captured in camera and and it was done in one take oh um, yeah it was yeah. impressive don't get me yeah. Wrong. yeah yeah so one take there were i think there were three big kind of tipper part tipper part cannon things that bounced these balls and yeah, there are 250,000 of them. When, when we first talked about it, we wanted a million. Um, but um, unfortunately, there weren't a million bouncy balls in all of the United States. And so we tried to get them from China, um, but it was going to take too long to ship them to the States. So there were all of these things which were brilliant. And then there were some things that were so kind of San Francisco. So they had people on roller skates to pick up any stray balls. You know, I think that's, you know, brilliant design because that, that creates a story as well. Um, but yeah, it was a kind of lovely project. What's interesting as well, I think, is that the people, you know, I didn't understand kind of advertising well enough at this point to, to kind of know what happens or kind of how it happens. Um, but, uh, but the creative director for the project, Juan Cabral, you know, he's not the director of the advert. Of course, the director of the advert is someone who's a film director. Um, and so, yeah, I, I didn't quite understand, I think, how kind of hierarchical these things were. You know, I was still... Mm. you know in my kind of mindset of you know we'll just go and do it ourselves um rather than you know getting hollywood special effects people to make the kind of ball cannons um so no, it, was a, it was a fascinating project though um when you were talking about music yeah uh, this kind of ai music it reminded me of uh a musician um holly herndon mm -hmm. who she so she released an album i think a couple of years ago with um with an ai element yeah. okay and what uh, i found interesting about that was uh not so much that in itself and the music but in the how she talked about this ai as kind of well it's a popular thing you know when people want to especially artists they want to sort of downplay uh the specifics of technology to say you know technology is just a tool yeah you know it's just an instrument but she, um, she actually, they called um, her and her partner called this AI Spawn. Yeah. I think the album's yeah. called Proto. Yeah. And in interviews I read, they were talking about it as a collaborator. So they were not talking it quite as a, you know, this is just like a drum or a guitar or a drum machine. They're like, no, yeah. this is actually like, this is like being in a band. Yeah. Um, 
I don't know. Is that something that interests you? Do you think there's something? Is this is there something fundamentally different going on there? Well, I, yeah, I, it's funny because I'm I am really interested in it, and you know, I've I've I have tried to listen to a few. I have listened to a few recent kind of AI tracks, and of course, they kind of range in you know from the from the kind of interesting, but I wouldn't listen to it again to the. Um, you know, I can see that it has kind of mass appeal, like some of the very kind of manufactured kind of pop AI um, to something where, you know, there's a project which is kind of um, kind of recreating some of our, you know, the artists that died when they were 27 and kind of imagining what they might, might do now. So, so I think, I don't know, I feel like this is still quite kind of early on, and, but I do. We're kind sort of, of in the talking dog situation, you know, don't be amazed about what, don't listen to what it says, just be amazed that it. Yeah. Talks. That's right, yeah. So I think, but I do think that uh, a few of the tracks I've heard recently have been really quite interesting. You know, they sound kind of credible, although they do f sound have sounded a bit like a kind of pastiche of something else. And I guess, mm. you know, maybe that's because it's kind of early on. I, I also like, though, the the kind of other side of this. So people like um, Matthew Herber and his kind of manifesto for creating music and, you know, it being again, very kind of honest. He'll only ever use the material that's kind of provided to him. He does things with, you know, big bands and traditional instruments. And you know, he did a, uh, he's done a number of albums that are kind of, you know, very kind of conceptual. Um, so an album about the, the life of a pig mm -hmm. and an album about um, the top 10 selling items in Tesco's. Um, you know, I kind of like this as well, but, but actually, you know, at that kind of extreme, it reminds me a little of the kind of AI made stuff in that, you know, it's back to the talking dog. You know, I, I really like the kind of concept, but I'm not so sure I like the music. Um, yeah. And I think, I think though, actually, it doesn't really kind of matter, I think, if I like it or not. It's, it feels like it's kind of coming. Um, I thought for a while about the difference, though, between kind of music and, you know, art. Um, not that artists hold a paintbrush now, but, you know, I was kind of imagining, well, you know, maybe, or I was kind of testing, um, you know, you know, will it happen um, to maybe kind of fine art painting? And of course it will, you know, at the, you know all, all I'm, the, the only barrier at the moment is that kind of, um, you know, the kind of hand eye thing. And, you know, I'm sure that's really kind of very simple to solve. Well, actually that's, that's someone's uh, got some questions here from ah, Facebook, okay. which are, touching on this so here's three questions that i guess are kind of on that theme what's the role of traditional art in the future will it be replaced by technologies and do you believe there will be less admirers of traditional art in the future yeah well last question first maybe will there be less admirers i don't think there will um i do think that again it's back to the kind of maybe uh you know with diamonds um, you know, we can we can manufacture diamonds and manufactured diamonds can be bigger. They can be flawless. They can be absolutely perfect in terms of their color. They don't have the same value as the diamonds we dig out of the ground. Um, so maybe there'll be a differentiation in the same way. Maybe. Um, I think, the, you know, there'll be a huge market for kind of old stuff, pre-AI, maybe. So maybe now's the time to start buying. Um, and... You know, I think the th the reason that we're touched so often, it's the kind of, it's the human bit. It's that kind of essence. You know, the reason that I still listen to music that was made in the kind of, or written maybe in the 1920s, um, is because it kind of, it still speaks to me and that kind of human, and that human level. And, you know, maybe, or, you know, if, if AI can start speaking to me as if it's a human, you know, I don't know, it won't be a human. I don't know. I'm not, I'm not quite sure. I think we need to kind of test this um what were the other questions sorry i've forgotten um essentially will they be replaced by technologies what is the role of traditional art in the future mm. yeah i don't know i think the you know, I, I guess you could ask what's what what is what is the role of tradition of art you know whatever what is what what is you know through history what's been the role of art you know it's been it's been to you know reflect the Kind of contemporary culture maybe maybe that's a more kind of recent thing um it's been uh i guess you know further back to kind of immortalize people through kind of painting rich patrons 
um, you know, we still have that kind of system, don't we, of rich patrons in the arts. It might not be, you know, individual rich people. It might be rich corporations now. Um, uh, I think there will still be a, a role for artists then because it's about, you know, unfortunately art is about, or can be at that kind of level, it's about money and commerce and those kinds of things. Um, yeah. And there was another question, but I've forgotten that one too. I've got a... I, I think that was along the same. That's yeah. Um, yeah. Things. Um, yeah. Here's a good one. What if you're a designer, but you don't want to get into technology? Yeah. Well, I don't think you have to. Yeah. Um, I really don't. And I think, you know, one of the things that that I do, so when I showed that image of all of uh, a group of students doing a kind of um, tech workshop, that wasn't all of the students. You know, they were the students that I could muster um, the ones that I could persuade. Um, an awful lot of our students aren't, in, aren't interested in those things. I do think, though, that an awful lot of tech has um, made doing things that were quite complicated until recently quite easy. Um, so, you know, for example, it's easy to mock up an app for a designer. We do this all the time in Adobe XD. Um, and then... You know, if you wanted to kind of go ahead and create that app, you'd pass it over to someone else. So, you know, those things are kind of easy. That's as easy as using, you know, InDesign. And so if you want to be a graphic designer, you have to use InDesign. There's no getting around it. You can use Adobe XD and it's simple. Um, yeah. And then, then, of course, as designers, we tend to work with others. Um, and so in the studios that I've worked in kind of most recently, it's been really interesting. We've got a range of people. Um, so, you know, not all designers, you might have a kind of design historian, a uh, designer and a coder. And, you know, so you end up having these kind of mixed studios, people with different skills. Um, you know, it's a bit like, you know, in, in fashion, you know, not everyone is the fashion designer. Um, you know, you have people who are kind of fabric technologists and, you know, pattern cutters and a whole kind of range of other people. You end up with specialisms. And the same in computer games. Um, you know, you have people who design the environments and people who design the characters and people who do the coding. I think um, maybe in, in terms of graphic design, it's similar. Um, you know, you, yeah. I think we're on a hiding to nothing if we, if we try and be jack of all trades. Mm -hmm. You know, we've got to specialise. Yeah, I mean, when I'm thinking about that, that person's question, yeah. it also makes me think that, um, you know, we tend to focus on, the new, you know, especially for the kind of early adopters and pioneers yeah. such as yourself. Yeah. But like, um, and that can be interesting, of course, like sci even, even further for like science fiction, you know, it can be really like really exciting, of course. But, um, you know, I, often interesting things happen once, only once the technology has had time to yeah. percolate and become I mean, a sort of classic example is, is, is like text messaging, isn't it? Like that was not designed to be a major feature of mobile phones. Yeah. And yeah. But people did it. And, you know, I'm sure designers were going, they're, they're using it wrong. That's not yeah. what it's for. Yeah. But it's only by just the public deciding, no, we want to use it in this way. So perhaps, you know, this person can look at, it is interesting yeah. how, you know, how old Facebook, but it's interesting. I mean, it's interesting for me watching how my parents use Facebook. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's, it's different. Yeah. Yeah, that's a point actually I wanted to make in the presentation. You've reminded me and I forgot um, about, you know, as designers, we make sense of this tech. We're kind of sense makers. And, you know, Steve Jobs, when he first presented the iPhone, he had, you know, probably no intention at that point of the kind of app store and the things, you know, the other things that we might do with it. And um, it was a device that was kind of locked. And, you know, I think does us designers, we're really good at this. We're really good at looking. This is why I've been working with, um, uh, Google on on Nest, um, you know, looking at something and then thinking, well, we could also do this other thing. It's crazy, but it might be fun. Um, you know, we're we're good at that. Um, yeah, and I kind of feel like it's our job, um, yeah, to to make sense of these devices. And it doesn't mean that we have to, you know, write the code. Um, yeah, I'm I'm useless at that as well. You know, <laughs> I, I'm. <laughs> it's not something that I'm interested in doing. Um, but I'm good at. Yeah, working with other people to suggest the kind of things that we might do. I, I remember this um, reminded me of well, this general point, and you mentioning Steve Jobs reminded me that um, 
in, in contrast to say like the launch of a new iPhone, like the highest end, like top uh, product, you know, in that market. Um, I remember I mean, it's quite a while ago reading an article which was explaining um, about what a revolutionary effect like the cheapest mobile phones had had in Africa in terms yeah. of democracy and being able to have um, fair elections yeah. because they just suddenly there was a communication network that ordinary people could yeah. maintain to kind of, to, you know, to monitor the, and keep the elections fairer. So, you know, that was not about the, that's not about the top phone at the moment. It's about the cheapest phone. Yeah. Yeah. But that can still be revolutionary. Yeah. It's interesting, isn't it? Again, it's back to the, you know, do you design things for everyone? And, you know, there are certain situations where, you know, of course, um, because of cost and because of the, fact, the fragile nature of your iPhone and because of the lousy battery life, you know, it's not going to work in some environments. And so this is why you need to design things for, you know, specific audiences rather than everyone. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think, it's, I think it's fascinating though. A really interesting point. I think I've probably read the same article. <laughs> it was ages ago, so I don't know yeah. where it is. But. Yeah, it's in the back of my mind somewhere. A yeah. um, couple more questions on this face from the Facebook. Um, <laughs> from the Facebook, sound like my parents, sorry. Yeah. Uh, have, have big companies changed their requirements for job seekers? So yeah. I guess this is about skills, like technical yeah. skills, or technological skills, right? Yeah. Uh, so... So I, I don't know. I mean, I've spoken to, I have spoken to some, um, you know, fairly, fairly, very well-respected kind of graphic designers about this. So people like um, Tony Brook at Spin. And what I found really interesting in his response is that he, you know, he said, well, uh, graphic design, grad so graphic design specifically, but graphic design graduates now are, you know, technically highly skilled. And they're, they're probably better skilled than the people hiring them. So there's been this kind of odd reverse where our, our students have yeah, better technical skills than the people who are employing them. The problem is they don't have experience. Um, and, and it's difficult to find that experience. And so this is through, you know, it is unfortunately still through things like internships. It's through, you know, competitions. It's those things that are you know, real um, rather than kind of simulated, I think, like some of the projects that you do when you're studying. Um, yeah, and it's also about getting your kind of work out there. And it's about, you know, I, I used to cringe when I was a student and my tutors talked about, you know, professional networks and networking. Um, but it is about that. You know, it's about, you know, it's about kind of plugging yourself into that somehow and seeing yourself as part of that. Um so, so yeah, things have changed. And so I think it's, it's, you know, also, of course, there are some fundamental changes. So, you know, how do you get your work in front of someone? It's an awful lot easier than it used to be um, because you can send them an email. You know, in the past, you'd have to, you know, do all kinds of stupid, fancy things in terms of your CV and your portfolio, and you'd have to go and see someone, all of those kind of things. Yeah. So it's, it's a lot easier now. I'm often explaining to my students just how awful yeah how much wasted time yeah you would have in, in in those days yeah it was awful i kept my portfolio when i when i worked for a design studio but i was looking for another job um you know i couldn't take my portfolio into the studio because everyone would know that i was looking for another job so i i kept it with a dry cleaner around the corner um so yeah those really yeah kind of covert things you used to have to do but of course now the problem is you know people are receiving lots of emails so, you know, how do you make yours stand out? And, you know, according to Tony, there are some fairly simple things, you know, so he'd like to, he'd like to receive, this probably isn't the same for everyone, but he'd like to receive a PDF. It can't be too big. There can't be too many images. Um, there needs to be some kind of explanation um, in his, in the email that you send him or others, um, you know, it needs to be personalized. You can't just put, you know, dear sir, um, you know, blah, blah, blah. You know, you need, you need to explain to whoever it is why you want to work for them um yeah so it's those kind of things and then i think yeah doing things like competitions they really help um i'm surprised that that a lot of graduates still get jobs through shows 
Um, you know, that's really difficult in COVID, of course, because there aren't any shows. But but when things come get back to normal, um, yeah, I'm surprised. Particularly my friends in architecture, um, they mm. tend to um, they tend to go to student graduate shows and yeah, pick up people or suggest that people uh, you know come for a chat through things like that. So it's really important. Yeah, I mean, I feel like as well that it's, um, I, I guess, like art school can never have a completely sympathetic relationship with industry because, well, if, if we completely ignore it, then it's not healthy in preparing our students for work. But however, um, some industry may consider that we should, we are, should be there, um, what was it, for providing, um, what's it, apprenticeship rather than, yeah. whereas we in the education may think, well, no, part of our job is actually to challenge yeah. the state of what you're doing yeah so you know we're never exactly seeking a perfect harmony with with no. the industry no i think that friction's a good one though um dear jim and chris i'm really uh sorry to interrupt you but just would like to remind that we unfortunately have a short of time so um we really appreciate your time and I think that it's a great honor for us to have you here today. Uh, so just I would like to uh, also uh, say that our uh, we appreciate our audience to be with us today and thank you for your questions and we hope that uh, there will be more interesting events uh, that you can be involved in because we would really uh, be grateful if you could join our other activities. Cool. Thank you so much. And I uh, just would like to remind the audience that this session has been recorded. So you will have uh, the link uh, once it is ready. And it will be sent to um, your emails. Uh, so thank you so much for being with us today and wish everyone a very good day. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks, Chris. Bye.